Um, thanks. Can everybody hear me? Good. Um, preconceived ideas. We all have them. There's nothing wrong with them. Um, we're human beings. That's the way we work. But uh, opportunities like this are chances to look at those preconceived ideas and find out, are they right or are they wrong? And clearly, if they're wrong, we have to change our preconceived ideas. Some of us may have come to this symposium, looked at all the green uniforms, and wondered, are we really under-resourced? And then you hear 512 million rand. Is that under-resourced? And then we look at the other provinces, the other countries. Ish. Many of us came here thinking, gee, rhinos. The rhinos are in a bad way. We had a whole session on rhinos, and it looks like they're being sustainably used. And yet we've lost three species of cycads in the last 10 years. You know, these preconceived ideas, they're not necessarily wrong, but we need to interrogate them. We need to go a bit uh, closer. Um, Melita this morning was telling us about um, the Kenyan fisheries there. Now, many of us, myself included, have spent hours talking about how smashed our fisheries are, how overfished areas are. But when you compare it to Kenya, we could be a heck of a lot worse. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is fishing competitions in uh, uh, marine protected areas. And the example I'm using is Isimangaliso. Um, just a bit of background in it for those of you who don't know. In Isimangaliso, it's a World Heritage Site. There is the World Heritage Authority. They basically run the show. Uh, Isambelo, KZN Wildlife are the biodiversity managers. So basically, we run the nuts and bolts of the things. One of the nuts and bolts that we run is the fishing competitions. So we know the numbers, um, the offtakes, the catch returns, all that kind of information. So today my job is to look at, oops, hopefully, but it hasn't changed there. Sorry, it's going to, okay. Oh, that's confusing, so I'll just go by that, okay. <laughs> As I was saying, preconceived ideas. Some of you in the audience um, well, all of us will have preconceived ideas on the applicability or appropriateness of fishing competitions in marine protected areas. So let's start with an hypothesis. Competitions are inappropriate in marine protected areas. Now let's look at this a little bit deeper. Some of the reason behind it could be that it brings in extra skillful anglers to a marine protected area. It also focuses on catching large numbers of big fish. So there's more people coming in and they're focusing on catching these fish, not sitting on the beach, but in catching fishes. It creates a hunting atmosphere inside a protected area. You know, as the chairman said just now, it's like going into a game reserve and thinking about shooting in Yala. You go into a marine protected area, you think about killing fish. And prizes are given for the catching and killing of fish. Many people feel this is completely inappropriate in a marine protected area. This is a photograph taken, top 10 fishing competition at Sudwana Bay. This is how a lot of people view fishing competitions, particularly in marine protected areas. There's a magnificent big fish, a top predator shot, oh sorry, killed inside a marine protected area by relatively rich people for their own recreation. Okay, but let's look at the facts. And the facts are available, and the facts are here. Here we go back. We've got figures from 2006. The number of fishing competitions in Isimangaliso was just over 20. And it's more or less progressively increased. Projected figures this year, over 120. That's a massive increase in fishing competitions. So clearly, if they are inappropriate in marine protected areas, we have to do something. But there's other facts about fishing, uh, marine competition, <laughs> fishing competitions in marine protected areas. Isambelo is committed to bottoms in bed. Sometimes they don't use the word bottoms. But the bottom line is the same. We need to bring people in. We need to make money. And in some areas, most of the people come to fish. Again, we've got the information. We look at Sudwana Bay, for example. Less than half the boat launching there now is fishing. But then when we look at Cape Vidal, over 98% of all launches are fishing orientated. If people didn't fish at Cape Vidal inside the protected area, we would be losing more money, and we are committed to putting bums in bed. Inexperienced anglers kill many fish. You know, we're saying the competitions bring in skilled anglers. Inexperienced anglers probably do kill more fish than experienced anglers. I catch, well, I used to catch quite a lot of fish. I let nearly all of them go, and hopefully being a little bit more skilled, many of the fish I do let go do survive. The catch returns generally are poor. Ask the Ori people. Voluntary catch returns. Catch returns that we get from the people fishing. It's generally so poor it's misleading. The, the boat launch site registers. The information we get from that, I believe, is now being binned, basically. 
We tried to get them to fill in catch returns. It doesn't work. Uh, compliance is a problem, particularly with the uh, SHAD uh, situation at somewhere like Cape Vidal this year. There were terrible problems with trying to control the situation on the ground. So there are problems. But if you look at the facts again, the fishing competitions are not all exactly the same. There's four different kinds. Estrine, uh, shore, offshore, and spear. Let's look at them individually. Estrine fishing competitions. Oh, well, clearly that's not a huge issue. It was either one or two, and in the last three years, zip. Then we look at spearfishing competitions, very controversial. One or two, basically one in the last three years. So clearly there's not large numbers of those. Then we look at the big ones, the ski boat competitions. And there, over the last seven years, no visible trend. It's not really going up or down. Maybe it's coming down a little bit, but it hasn't increased. And look at the y-axis, 30. But look at the next one, the shore fishing competitions. That's where the increases come. Market, massive. But what does it mean? The reality is that estuarine competitions, we've basically phased them out. We insist where we can. It's catch and release only. And I say there have been none for the last three years. We don't really anticipate any more coming. So that's just the reality at the moment. The spear competitions are at a very low level. I won't go into them. There's not too much negotiation with that situation. The catch and release story is not, not too applicable. The ski boat competitions are not increasing. We're not sure exactly what they're doing. There's big economic factors changing out there, but there is no sustained increase. What is happening is that shore fishing competitions are increasing. Okay, let's look at management of competitions uh, in the recent past and right up to date. In the past, uh, we've had various problems with uh, managing the fishing competitions and actually running them and controlling them and putting on conditions and holding them to the conditions that we've given them. But let's update ourselves. At the moment, all the competitions we hope that are being held are registered. It's a legal requirement now that they register for a competition, that they get permission before they do it. In the past, they didn't, register, didn't have to register. It wasn't a legal requirement. So that's an improvement. Poor catch return, we get 100% catch return now from the competitions. And they're pretty accurate because most of them are competitions. It's people... It's generally one club, the shore fishing competitions particularly, competing against another club, and it's extremely carefully monitored, and we get their catch returns. It's accurate. Uh, no release required. In the shore fishing competitions now, which is the vast bulk of the number of competitions, it's 100% catch and release by agreement with the clubs, and we only allow clubs to hold competitions, not individuals. Little self-regulating, I put fierce regulating. You, Tony could give you some of the details. These people, it's clubs competing against each other. And they will report each other. They will try and catch each other out. Because if one club cheats and is found to be cheating, they lose all the points for that. And there's an annual league on the go at the whole time. So there's fierce reporting of other people breaking rules. Legally enforceable, as I said now, in, uh, whereas in the past it wasn't a legal requirement um, to have a written permission before a competition, it's now legally enforceable. Relations were poor in the past as a result of all sorts of things like the beach ban and so on, but right at the moment our relations with the whole spectrum of fishing, competition, uh, fishing clubs is better than it was. Okay, um, if we look at the impacts of the fishing competitions, uh, the potential impacts, that's basically 2006 and uh, 2011. Um, the pure numbers just calculated out from the figures we got. You can see approximately 2,000 fish uh, would have been caught in 2006 and 6,000 in 2011. But the way we're managing it now with the compulsory catch and release from shore fishing, in actual fact, the overall number of fish killed, we anticipated last year, were less than were killed in 2006 because of the way it's now being managed. If we look at it another slightly different way in terms of mass, um, these are all fishing competitions, sorry, combined. So the greater mass here is because uh, many of them are uh, ski boat fishing competitions. And as we saw before, ski boats catch much more fish and much bigger than shore fishing. Uh, here you can see again the actual impact. The shore fishing component, the blue component, is actually quite small. But what's happening with the ski boat fishing people very few of them now kill the billfish, and the billfish are obviously the big fish. Uh, whether or not those fish survive, or all of them survive, we're not sure. But that is the situation we think is happening at the moment, and it looks like an improvement. 
The benefits to Ismvelo. Well, let's clinically look at this thing. Revenue. I mean, we've heard about revenue and lack of revenue. I've estimated um, that we make more than five and a half million rand from the fishing competitions themselves at places like basically Cape Vidal and Sudwana Bay. Information, we get good catch returns and we can enter that data obviously in spreadsheets and work out catch per unit effort. We can see what species are there, relative abundance, all that kind of thing. Improved relations, I've touched on that already. Feedback from supportive users. We get feedback not just in one, co one fishing competition reporting and another one or one club and another one. We get feedback on general conditions. They've highlighted management problems where we've reacted in the field and tightened up control. Provide an um, appreciated and valuable service. We try and make our reserves relevant to the people and it's extremely difficult. But at least in this instance, we've got allies now and um, powerful allies scattered throughout the country who will speak up in our uh, defense. And we've got a detailed example of a management outcome. We've carefully done this thing and it's all um, checked and balanced and counted and the files are there. We can actually prove, back up everything we're seeing. So for example, the financial benefit, 5.5 million. I did the calculations a few months ago and then couldn't find them. So I thought, uh oh, it actually sounds a lot. Somebody's not gonna trust Kyle. So Kyle then went back and he actually worked out the whole thing. The average number of boats per competition, days fished per competition, et cetera, et cetera, average accommodation rate. And it was basically four and a half million just for the accommodation, just during um, the, the, the ski boat competitions. And then the fuel, I couldn't believe it. So I double checked it and it's true. And that figure of 1.1 million is 6% of the 27 million that we estimated they spent in fuel. And you think 27 million in fuel, but it's true. You work out the liters a boat uses per day and the cost, it's a huge amount of money. Then we get into the next little lot. No, I gave up. <laughs> I am not a social scientist at the moment, um, but you understand there it is at least five and a half million and it's actually a huge a lot more and that's not even looking at the spin-off benefits. Okay, the benefits to users, they've got an excellent venue for the competition. They wouldn't come if they didn't think it was a really good venue. User-friendly and fair system. If they apply for a competition, we can run it through the system, usually within 24 hours. And if, they, if there's any problem, we bounce it straight back to them and we usually try and accommodate them. But we have our absolutely strict rules. We do not bend our rules. If they don't apply correctly, if there's something wrong, bad luck. They know that, so they stick to the rules. Relatively safe fishing, that's one of the reasons that people are coming in. Um, it was alluded to earlier on. The KZN coast is becoming very difficult to fish, unsafe in many areas, particularly in the evening. But if you fish round about Cape Vidal, you should be reasonably safe, for example. 37 clubs from six provinces have all voted with their feet in this last year. It's an in becoming an internationally acclaimed venue for fishing and for fishing competitions. And the improvements in management, just to scan over them again, permission is now a legal requirement. Now that's great. It's great to be able to hit someone if you need to, because in the past, the compliance was more or less just if they wish to comply. Estuarine, estuarine competitions are basically um, stopped, and we, view, uh, we all basically view estuarine areas as nursery areas and competitions, any kind of fishing there, as basically inappropriate. Agreements, uh, shore fish, caught being released, uh, shore fishing, all the fish caught released, that was a request from the clubs to us. Please stop the killing of all fish caught in shore fishing competitions. So with their request, we have complied and we only issue permission to the clubs. There is no known killing of fish in shore competitions at the moment. Most billfish are released. That was again basically come from their side because there's no re um, requirement from our side. Um, almost complete and accurate catch information. But these people, there we are. And I'll point out the one is actually smiling. Now for those of you out there, there's nothing wrong with being happy in a marine protected area. And that is a tagged fish. The gentleman holding the fish mostly has got gloves on, the other one's not. That fish will be returned and there's hopefully a good chance it will survive. But these people, they want to carry on fishing and to do what they're, and to do that, they are prepared to Provide accurate and complete catch data. Cooperate with management. Abide with sensible rules. Discipline their ranks. Protect fish stocks. Report other offenders, discipline other ranks. And to pay for the privilege. 
Now, why are they going to do this? I'll tell you why they're going to do it. Because if they don't do it, they will get no more fishing competition permission. So we've got them by the... <laughs> what, what our CEO referred to the other day. Um, yeah, we can, we can actually control them. So the hypothesis is that fishing competitions are inappropriate. Well, they do bring in extra numbers of good fishermen. They do focus on large numbers of fish. And the, the, the hunting, when you hear them discussing the fishing, yes, but it's becoming much more ethical. Each time, each year you go, they're talking more about releasing fish and techniques of reducing mortality. And prizes are given for catching and killing fish. Yes, but as it says in the Bible, whether you're hung for a sheep or a lamb, it makes no difference. So if the fish is dead, whether the prize are big or small, is actually not a biodiversity issue. What is appropriate in MPAs? The mission of Isambello, that's the mission, and it talks about efficient conservation and sustainable use. And I believe that we can now show that the way we are managing competitions is indeed that. What about the high-level deliverables, the APPs? That's what we're told we must uh, adhere to in Isambello. These are the most important things. If they're not done, our 512 million is in jeopardy. And BC1 is sustainably harvest all that amount of money. Now, the fishing competitions already do almost 3% of that, with basically very little management and input on a voluntary basis, and they pay us 5.5 million. Another one is increased stakeholder satisfaction by 15%. Ask the user group here. You can contact them. They're going to tell you this thing, as far as they're concerned, is going well. We can show that competitions in, now, in Isimang Liso are now increasing in number, but well controlled and improving, sustainable and self-monitored, in line with Isimvelo policy and goals, and can indeed be part of wise use. But we can still make more progress. What more progress can we make? We can work with the uh, competition organizers to find other ways of reducing mortality and morbidity of the fish that are being caught. And we can work on the ski boat fishermen. They're kind of difficult because they're investing, they say, a huge amount of money. They want returns. But they have, they, they now let go nearly all the billfish. What is appropriate in the MPAs? Well, our vision, again, is to be a world-renowned leader in the field of biodiversity conservation. And I believe that we've now got the facts that can show that allowing competitions the way we are at the moment is actually working towards this goal, not against it. Thank you. Thank you, Scotty. And you left enough time for one or two very short questions. We'll start with Stuart. Just wait for the microphone, if you would. I said mine's quite short. Um, is there a limit? Are you going to limit the number of competitions? I mean, you showed that the shore fishing is up to 120. Are you, is there going to be a cap at some stage? Um, and how, how are you going to work out what that cap is? Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, if you look at it again in the categories, the, 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 the ski boat competitions don't seem to be doing anything drastic. If they became too big to be accommodated by the accommodation, we'd have to do something. The shore fishing competitions... We'll get several applications for the same place in one weekend. And it could be there's competition between the two of them. And what we've said is that if we find a problem on the ground, a management problem, we will immediately react next time and reduce the number of competitions. But so far, we've let it flow. And we haven't picked up any, competition, any uh, conflict, any management problems on the ground. If we do, we can immediately cut the con uh, competitions. We don't have to think that we can increase numbers to 150 or whatever, some arbitrary number and stop. We're managing it on the ground on a competition to competition basis. As soon as there's a problem, we can pull back. Last question, Jeremy Cliff had his hand up. Actually, two parts. The first is, um, Scotty, thanks for a very convincing um, presentation. What is the Wetland Parks Authority's take on this? Are they on the same page as you? Or are they around? <laughs> at the back <laughs> and then the other thing I wanted to ask you is, is what sort of level of control have you got I know the shark huggers are very concerned that from the shore angling point of view a lot of the raggies that are caught at Cape Vidal and, and Sudwana are in fact uh, pregnant females and there's obviously some concern about, about that yeah that, that, that's a very good point with the relations we've got with the clubs at the moment we can close areas boom Somebody applies to fish somewhere. If we have good information that raggies are popping or something in that area, we can close that area. 
we can do it arbitrarily, but we can actually just inform the, the clubs, look, there's a problem in this area. Turtles at Panganek, for example, because uh, most of these people fish at night time, the shore fishermen. Hey, when the turtles are beating at Banganek, no competitions, no negotiation, not a problem. We can manipulate the situation whichever way we want. Thank you, Scotty.